Stan, it's great to see you again. Great to see you too. What I ate in one year, yeah. brackets and related thoughts, is not literally a shopping list of what you ate in a year, and it's not really even so much a diary. How would you describe this book to readers? Uh, it's a sort of a, 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 an account of the passage of time uh, through the prism of what I ate in one year. The last time we spoke, you did talk about how food dominates your thoughts. Mm -hmm. If you're not actually eating, you're thinking about what you're going to be eating <laughs> yes. next. Yeah, yeah. And it's really clear reading this book, you know, just what that really means, I suppose, through the course of a year. There's a really lovely bit right at the beginning of the book where you're filming Conclave, mm -hmm. uh, the movie. And I was really surprised to hear you saying that actually the problem with on-set catering can be that it's terrible. Mm. And you actually cooked for yourself quite a lot and brought your own food in. Mm -hmm. Please explain to me. Well, unless you, know, unless you have a huge movie, and if, I've never, I've never had this, but there are actors who have personal chefs, right? And a lot of times that's because they have a very specific fitness right regimen that mm -hmm. they have to stick to and they have to eat at certain times of day to keep weight off build muscle and all that sort of stuff um and they have somebody there for them doing that and it makes sense because the hours are long you don't have time to go and you just can't eat sort of random mm. stuff um but most film catering is for the most part not very good in <laughs> italy it's especially bad and I think part of the reason is because Italians, Italians don't really do catering. Do you know what I mean? What we know is sort of catering. Yeah. They'll, a lot of Italian food is cooked um, very quickly. Or unless you're doing like a lasagna or something that's slow roasted or, a lot of Italian food is just, we have this stuff, we put it in the pan, mm -hmm. we toss it up, we add the pasta, we add the rice or whatever, and then we serve it. And it gets eaten that fast. If it sits around and waits, it's just gross, right? <laughs> so it, so uh, catering for a movie, on a movie set, you're feeding a huge number of people. You can have an appointed lunchtime, but that lunchtime inevitably gets pushed because you need to spend a little more time on a shot, so you have to push lunch, and you have to this, and how many people are actually there, and blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. Mm. So the stuff just sort of sits there, and it's kind of gross, um, particularly if it's not good food to begin with. Yeah. It's like doubly gross. So it just doesn't work. So I have made a, a habit for many years to just bring my own food. Um, and it's just easier because I know what I want to eat. I know the energy that I need to expend while I'm working. And I need to eat certain things that I can't just show up and go like, oh, today they're making, you know, spicy ribs or something. First of all, I don't eat spice. Mm -hmm. I can't eat spice. And second of all, why would I want to eat ribs in the middle of the day when I have to <laughs> then go to a scene that's either what's the scene? You know, it could be a very emotional scene. It could be a physical scene. It could be a love scene could be whatever. I don't want to eat ribs. No. I just want something really simple, like a salad. But then also if they have a salad, like what kind of oil do they have for mm. the salad? And what is that lettuce? Do you know what I mean? Where's that lettuce from? Not to sound like a snob, but it's just like, I don't need anything fancy. Yeah. I don't want anything fancy. You know, I want to show up. I want to have some, maybe some eggs in the morning or some oatmeal and then I'll, I'll, I'll handle it from there. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you do actually when you arrive sort of where you're staying for Conclave, you, you make yourself some tomato sauce to go with pasta. And this is something that comes up again and again in the book. Obviously the basis for a lot of Italian dishes will be that marinara sauce. Yeah. Can you please take me through, because everyone will have their own version of how they do this. Oh, yeah. But I, from what I can gather from the book, your food is always fresh and sounds delicious. So I wonder what your method is for making that very basic marinara sauce. Well, the very basic marinara sauce is, it comes from my family's recipe. And there are so many different versions of it, but I put, I put onion in mine. I'm not so sure my mother always put onion in, but I put a little onion because it makes it a little bit sweeter. Um, just a little chopped onion, not like fine or anything, kind of roughly chopped. And then a couple of garlic, garlic cloves, but again, not fine, just mm -hmm. cut in half, 
you saute that for a little bit in some olive oil. And then you throw in some canned tomatoes, um, good canned tomatoes, not just like, you know, and even if they say like, oh, excuse me, these are organic and they're from Seattle or wherever, you're like, no, nah, all right. I don't really care. Are they good? Do they taste good? That's yeah. all I care about. And basil and salt. That's it. You Not can simple. put oregano if you choose. Uh, but now I, I, I did I did one I did one last night actually, which was I took fresh tomatoes, you know, a little pomodorini, mm -hmm. sauteed those with the onion and the garlic, and then put those aside, then took this new brand of tomato that I found, which is really nice, they're really delicate and they're in quite a bit of water and then you sort of, they're really delicious and um, cook those up in the same way. And then I put the two together with um, a little extra basil and that, that was it. And it was a really nice dinner. So there are so many different ways of doing yeah. it. Yeah. I think it's, but as you say, it's sort of good to have that, that basis from which you can Yeah, then... because then you can add anything you want to that. Yeah. You can add beans to that. You can put lentils in it. You can do you know, whatever. You can put green beans in it. You can put peas in it. You can put shrimp in it. You can put whatever the hell you want. In it. <laughs> One of the other things you just mentioned there as well is eggs. And you make very clear in this book that you love mm, eggs. Love eggs. Any form, yeah. you are quite happy to get in there. Whatever. Quite often combining it with things that I wouldn't think to combine it with. What, what, what is it about eggs that you love? I don't know. They bring things together. Okay. You know, they're a great kind of, uh, they're like a matchmaker or something. Do you know what I mean? They just take everything and bring it together. If yeah. you have like some of that, <clears throat> if I, just the marinara I mentioned with, with pasta, mm. if you scramble up an egg and add that to it, well, not too much sauce. I mean, it's absolutely delicious, but also poaching eggs in that marinara sauce with a little extra onion is just one of the most delicious things ever. They're great. You can, I mean, think about how many different ways you mm. can cook an egg. Mm. It's kind of endless. You can use them for anything. You can just use the yolk, you can use the white, you can use them together, you can, you know, they're in, they're kind of in so many things, which yeah. is, I always feel badly for people who have any kind of food allergy, mm. but an allergy to eggs, that's, that's a tough one. There are some foods, as you mentioned earlier, that you can't eat now, like yeah. sort of spicy food. So it, it, uh, if somebody took eggs away from you, do you think that? I would be Deficit. so sad. Also, I, I, I eat meat, but I can, I can eat um, sort of ground meat and yep. things that are soft and have moisture and stuff like that because of the radiation treatments that I had six years ago. So eggs are a way of getting protein for me. Right. So that would be hard to, yeah. One of the other things that you profess a very strong love for is soup. Hmm. And again, because a lot of people are like, really, soup? But you love soup. Again, can you explain what the appeal of soup is? And is this an, another one of these dishes that can be almost anything? Because you can... Yeah, exactly. You can do anything with it. As I write in the book, you know, you, soup is... I'd say soup is life in a pot, mm -hmm. you know. And it is, because it sustains you. It gives you life. It, it keeps you having life. And, you know, you can make soup out of water and garlic. That's all you need. <laughs> Some salt. You can make it out of onion. Yeah. You know, you don't, you know, you can have use two ingredients or 222 ingredients. You can make an incredible minestrone. You can put a thousand fucking vegetables in there if you want to. It's up to you. And that's kind of the beauty of it. Soup is a very personal thing. Yeah. You know, and you, it can be eaten hot or cold. You can, it lasts in the fridge for a while, make a big pot of it at the beginning of the week and by Friday you, you still have some, and, yeah. you know. I wouldn't eat it after five days, but you know, that's it. You have yeah. some, some soup limits. That you yeah, I have soup it. limits, yeah, okay. yeah. No, but I think it's amazing, I just think it's the most amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's one pot, right? You cook it in one pot. Yeah. And it feeds a whole lot of people. Mm. You can add starch to it, you can add meat to it, whatever. We, as I mentioned just before we started rolling, I had a week off work recently, and as a family, we decided to see whether 
with a staycation, we could still feel like we were going on holiday. So what we did was we put some countries in a jar and decided that we'd pull one out and that would be the country that we were going to and we would eat that cuisine. Oh, that's so smart. Italy came out of the jar. Mm. We were all secretly thrilled <laughs> Italy that Italy came, came out, out of the jar. <laughs> yeah, that's what we pulled. And what we decided to do, was, uh, I guess, was to try and see whether we too could eat like Tucci. So <laughs> that thing of taking <laughs> simple ingredients and just you know, honouring them and, and making good, tasty, home-cooked food. Yeah. And so I, as I was going through your book, and I was like, I'm going to try that. Well, let's try that. So we, you're often using things like green beans with pesto in pasta, which, oh, which yeah. I had never had before. With potato. With pot we did that with yeah. potato, yeah, which was it's great. It's a Gen uh, Genoa uh, Genovese uh, yeah. recipe, yeah. Which makes it much more filling, I suppose, and much, yeah, yeah good for those teenage boys. Yes. Uh, and then one thing which is already a bit of a family favourite, Papa El Pomodoro, the, mm. the soup, which is just... Tomato, basil, uh, garlic, and bread, I'm, leftover bread. Um, bread. Was it, is there onion in there? I think you put onion I in think, yours. I think yeah. I put it in mine, yeah. yeah. Just delicious. So simple, but so delicious. So good. Mm. I mean, but these are the poorest dishes in the world. Mm. It's nothing. I mean, the reason they put potatoes into their pasta is just to bulk it out, mm. you know? And the green beans, you're getting your veg, and the, the you're getting your all that flavor from the pesto. Mm. They're so simple. Papa yeah. Pomodoro, what is it? It's fucking stale bread and potato and tomato. Yeah, and yet somehow delicious. I know, I know. It's the quality of the ingredients, Yeah. right? Good olive oil, good. And they always had that yeah. because everything came from them. Everything came from their farm, from their little garden. So they knew what it was. Talking of children and food, yes. um, your eldest son is training during the book yeah. uh, at Leith's and, and is now He's a chef. A chef. Yeah. You must be very proud I'm of so, Papa. I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of him. Um, he, he, and he's good. It's not like, yeah, he's all right. It's like, <laughs> no, he's really good. Like he was born to do it. And that's really exciting mm. when you see that. Um, he came over last night, in fact, and he, we had, um, uh, what do you call it, beef carpaccio. Mm -hmm. So it, we're sort of celebrating my wife's birthday. Um, and I said, can you make the beef carpaccio like you did last time? And he came over and we got the beef over here at the overpriced butcher. And, and you know, you keep it in the fridge and the freezer for a little bit to give, make it so it's easy to cut. Yeah. And the, to watch him cut it and then piece it together and then the way he flattened it out and then dressed it with olive oil, salt, lemon, and arugula, or rocket. It was literally like the best beef carpaccio I've ever had. Like, and it sounds silly, mm. he didn't cook it. Mm. But if you know how to do it, if you have high quality beef, but also if you know how to do it, mm. it was like perfect. One of the things that really struck me reading the book was that, of course, you are eating out in restaurants an awful lot. Yeah. And some of the restaurants you go to are incredible. But I was thinking, how is it possible to maintain a healthy lifestyle if you're going out and eating that much? But what really comes through in this book as well is your fitness regime, because you quite casually, you just talk about doing a workout, doing Pilates, doing yoga, going to the gym. How many days a week are you doing that? Uh, usually six. Six days a week. Yeah. Because this is, the, I was going to say, this is the result, is that you can be this fit and healthy and enjoy that yeah, incredible yeah, level. Yeah, I think you, ha you have to. You have to. I love food. I love food. I love wine. I love martinis. Yeah. You know, and you have to balance everything out. Everything is a balance. Otherwise, it's just, like, gross. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're, like, you're just eating all the time and drinking, and it's just, like, gross. Yeah. So you balance it out. Um, you have to earn that stuff. You have to earn that food. And I think that's an okay thing. And I've always worked out. I always like working out. It makes me, makes me feel better. It makes me think more clearly. Mm. Um, if I go more than 20, if I go more than 48 hours without exercise, I start to like short circuit. Do you find that as well as the sort of health benefits, is there something that, with the mental health that helps? Yes, if you've without that? question. Yeah. Definitely helps your mental health. It releases something. Endorphins? That no, is, right. that, is that a sex thing? No, that's no, no, not no, a I sex think that's... thing. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it, maybe it Wait, could be that thinking, too, No, but... I'm thinking of something else. Uh, yeah, no, yes, it really, yeah. It just makes you, it gives you that, yeah. you know, 
you just feel better. You have, and no matter how tired you are, like waking up when I was shooting the, the series, you know, you wake up and, you know, the car is leaving at 7.30 or something to get to a location that's an hour and a half away or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And you just have to drag yourself out of bed and just do it. You know, there are some days where you go, I can't. Like, I literally can't. Like, I, sleep is more important. Mm. But sometimes that exercise can give you the same thing that sleep, that sleep gives you. You mentioned at the beginning that the book is about the sort of passage of time. And you do talk a bit about aging uh, through the book. And what you say is it's a bit like a clock, which is that it moves very slowly and it's, you look away and then you turn back and you realise that a lot of time has passed. And there's a lovely moment where your parents are there and you talk about your mum with her need to go to the shops mm -hmm. a lot and that kind of fitness actually that comes from frequent trips to the shops, walking up hills yeah. and down, down them again. Um, and th that's where she gets her fitness from in yeah. a way, which is a very sort of Italian mama kind of thing. Of, of it, it is. It's why those Italians live so long, mm. or the Greeks or, you know, people in Alpine villages and no matter what their whether Italian, German, Swiss, Norwegian, whatever. I mean, it's that movement. It's that, that constant movement. And this is what one of my trainers, Monique uh, Eastwood, talks about, is that, you know, the, 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 as we age, we have to keep moving. And mm. what happens is our body sort of fights against it because we feel tired or we feel whatever, or we have aches and pains or things don't quite work, knees don't work, work quite the way. But the consistency of exercise is the most important thing. And you have to continue that as you get older. Mm. And the more you continue that, the younger you'll remain. And I see my mom w walking. I mean, it's, I can't keep up with her. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not <laughs> kidding. We'll go for a walk. If I go to visit them there, we go for a walk when she comes here. Mm. I have to say to her, can you slow down? Like, you have to slow down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, she's on some mission. Um, and she will go to the shops four times a day, but her mother was like that too. Right. I didn't know her mother had a lap. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No story time yeah. on grandma's lap. No, there, there no, was no, no, it wasn't, no. no. Okay. No. <laughs> Is, would it be fair to say, because it's so clear that family is really, really important to you, and as you say in the book, sort of having as much time with them as possible, is that part of that drive for, for fitness and indeed for sort of enjoying food and, and wine and the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, without question. I mean, like I say, it just makes you better. It makes you a better person, mm. I think. And it allows you to, to... It allows me to feel more relaxed around people. Mm. And we know being around family isn't always the most relaxing thing. So the better shape you're in, probably the <laughs> better off you are in that regard. I don't know what that means. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I just, because I want to, I want to spend a lot of my time cooking mm. with the people I love, friends or family. Just towards the end of the book, uh, you mentioned the, the time I lost you actually, which was the uh, customer evening at Waterstones Piccadilly, where you signed oh, yeah. God knows how many books for God knows how many people. Um, but there's this sort of really lovely moment where it's sort of, it's heading towards Christmas and there's this real feeling of, again, family and food and people coming together. And there is this seasonal feeling to the book as we kind of go through the year, you can see the different foods that you're eating. You clearly have a love of Thanksgiving and Christmas, but is there a, a, do you have a favorite season of the year in terms of eating? Yeah, I think autumn and, and winter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do love summer and I love, you know, all the fresh vegetables and stuff like that. But like, I'm really looking forward to autumn. Uh, I love autumn and I love winter. Mm. Uh, there's just, you know, soup. There you go. <laughs> Soups, stews, lots of pastas, yeah. polenta, rice, risotto, all that kind of stuff. I really love it. I'm not a heat lover. Okay. I like the sun, but I don't like, I can't bear its heat. Yeah. Um, so I was just filming in um, January, maybe January, February in um, Trentino Alto Adige, where, where I had just gone skiing for the first time too. And um, I'd never skied up there before. And we went and filmed there about two weeks later in that area. It was just incredible. Incredible, because you're getting Austrian, uh, Austrian cuisine, sort of Hungarian cuisine, um, and Italian cuisine, all kind of together. Mm. And the wines are like fucking great. <laughs> um, right towards the end of the book, you go on a rather extraordinary 
visit to Guy Ritchie's, I think we'll have to call it a manor, it's not, it's not a house, um, with John Kaczynski, and you have this, what did I, did I just say that wrong? No, 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 no I'm just laughing because I'm thinking about it, no, no. But you have this extraordinary meal, there's a, there's a sort of shoot going on, there is this extraordinary cooking device that you see and I think then buy. No, I have. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me about that meal because it's really extraordinary. It's just one of the best times I've ever had. <laughs> Uh, I'm not kidding. I, I, I didn't know a guy before, and uh, John was working with him. So he said he wanted John to come in. And John was about, John hadn't met him either. He was about to do a movie with me, I hadn't met him. And he said, you know, do you think your brother-in-law wants to come? And John said, do you want to go with me? And I was like, yeah. I mean, I was, you know, I was quite nervous. Yeah. I, you know, I get very nervous about sometimes meeting new people, mm. especially people that I really admire. And we went, we had just had the greatest, it was like literally the greatest 24 hours of my life or however long it was. It was so much fun. He's so interesting. He's so smart. Uh, his family's lovely. And the place is like, when you, when you die and you go to heaven, like that, you go to Guy Ritchie's house. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, he's a hell of a, a cook. A, he's an obsessive about cooking, as are his friends. And it was just, it was amazing. Amazing. I'm gonna have to... I'm going there again in a couple of days. Well, oh. I'm so excited. My <laughs> wife's gonna come this time. I'm very excited for her to, to meet them. To, to go to heaven. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, to go to heaven. Yeah. yeah. That episode happens really close to, to New Year. And there's again, a really lovely moment at, at the end of the book where you're sort of celebrating New Year and you do a thing of sort of getting everybody to stand up and sort of, I guess, toast it. And again, it sort of shows this really strong love you have of other people's company, particularly family, and I suppose a gratitude f for that. Yeah. Would that be the sort of, I guess, the takeaway from this book f f for readers, or is there another message? I suppose so, yeah. I mean, yeah, I am very thankful for my life and the, the life I've led and the people that I've encountered, the people who raised me and... I'm very grateful. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not at times unhappy or, or but, yes, it's a celebration of that, but it's also kind of a, I'm just kind of ruminating on sadness. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of sadness in the book. There's mm -hmm. a lot, well, there's a lot about death in the book. Um, but yes, to me, that moment came out of, you know, remembering all the, the times I had spent at my friend Aiden and Lizzie's house, Aiden Quinn and his wife, in upstate New York, and we spent many, 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 many New Year's there. And at midnight, we would have a, Aiden would light a fire outside, we'd go stand around the fire, and we would um, uh, wish each other, you know, ring in the New Year like that with a glass of champagne or whatever. And it was great, we did it for many years, and I wanted to, I was missing that, mm. and we created we created that on the spot with you know around some candles. It was like raining and windy, of course. You know you're you know in England, so it's like you know. Um, but it was really lovely. It was lovely, and I think it's important to celebrate that and to acknowledge how lucky we are, how you know, acknowledging those people that we've lost, those people who can't be with us simply because of geography, but also the fact that we have these kids and, and you hope that those kids are going to do the same thing, that they will, you know, are, that the cousins will follow these traditions of getting together, cooking together, uh, hanging out with each other and celebrating, celebrating life, mm. you know. Th throughout the book, there is a sort of, uh, I guess, an anxiety with the, the TV series where you're trying to sort of find a home for it. Mm. Uh, the next series of, of a, you know, a, a program that I know lots of people have enjoyed following you around Italy. Thankfully, we, we, we can say that it does happen. Um, but this book gives any reader a chance, I suppose, to spend a year in your company, again, with that sort of thing of discovering food uh, and seeing what you get up to. I would suggest that maybe the next TV series could, I'm giving you this as, as a gift. Yeah. My idea of that you too can Tucci like I say, I think this could be the next TV series. Like, we can't all uh, have Guy Ritchie's uh, amazing cooking equipment, but we no. can eat like Stan Tucci. Of course you can. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing is, what I eat is incredibly simple. Like, it's not, and I just get good ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's all. It's not like I'm, you know, sh you know, flying truffles in every day, or do you know what I mean? Drinking, you know, gallons of you know, the finest champagnes mm. and wines, and like not at all, not at all. It's just about quality of ingredients. That's all, and then making them really simply. Mm. Doesn't really. If you got a grill, you can do it. If you got a stove, you can do it. Do you, just depends on do you want to do it. That's all. I mean, if you knew, like, I don't spend a lot of money on wine and stuff like that. I don't. No. I probably should spend more, but I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I have difficulty going. Yeah, I'm gonna pay that for that wine. Do you know what I mean? I know I can get this wine, and it's just yeah. just as good. Yeah. Know? In fact, there's the, I think it's after the Piccadilly evening. You go out and you have escargot with. Elizabeth Day and her husband. Yeah. And you, I think you say that as a last meal, sort of escargot, a simple glass of wine, red yeah. or white, yeah. and you and a you'd salad. Be, yeah. yeah. And you'd be sort of happy with that. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, what's better than that escargot wasn't great because they put little, they did like a puffy. No, they put it on like a pizza-like thing or something, and no, no. why? <laughs> why just put it in those? Things, one yeah. of the, you know those things designed for escargot. Yeah. Little holes. That's it. Yeah. Little holes. Covered butter, in butter. Garlic, parsley. Stick it in the oven. Take it out of the oven. Dip the bread in it. Eat it. That's it. Green salad. Wine. Bob's your uncle. Robert's your mother's brother. Yeah. <laughs> As you say, simplicity is the key. Um, but thank you so much. It's so great to speak to you again. Oh, it's great. It's food. great to talk to you. You're so good at this. It, it makes it so easy. Oh. No, really, really. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.